for our partners, Airtel and ISBAP. Thank you, guys. Okay, so now let's get into the program of how the internet works. I mean, how many of you use Twitter out there? A few of you? Okay, Jumia. Facebook. Are we supposed to say that now? Can we say that? <laughs> how many of you use Facebook with a VPN? Um, okay. Um, what happens when you type airtel.co.ug into your network? And that's what we're going to discuss today. And we've got some great videos and some great discussion we're going to talk about is you see a web page that comes up, but what happens behind the scenes? So my first question to Alan is, what is the internet? Just at a high level, what is the internet? Um, you know, without, without going into, you know, the technicalities of what it is, you know, think of the internet as a, as a super highway, right? So you've got, you've got a series of computers, right, and networks that are interlinked across the world, right? So the internet is like this super highway that's connecting various touch points of, of the world together, right, at a digital scale, right? So let's imagine, say, for example, you in Kampala, right? And you, wanna, you want to access either, I don't know, a video or a website that's seated, uh, you know, maybe it's, you want to, you want to access uh, Twitter, for example, right? And perhaps Twitter is, uh, is uh, stationed in uh, Seattle in, in, in the U.S. What happens is your, your computer or your device will need to have some sort of identification, right? Just like you've got a mobile phone, with a phone number that identifies that this number belongs to Alan. So the device or the laptop will have an IP address, right? An IP address that says this is the location of this particular device asking to communicate with another device in the US. And it wants to access this sort of information. So what your computer does is it gets that particular request breaks it down into packets of data, right? So it basically gets this one message, www.airtel.com, breaks it down into a series of packets. Now, this www.airtel.com perhaps is seated somewhere in the U.S. or wherever it's seated, right? So what the internet is or what it does is it gets that packet that has been broken down by your computer, breaks it down into multiple pieces, and then finds several different routes or highways to send that packet at light speed to the destination. So when it gets there, it gets reassembled and then opens up. So the internet, basically thinking about it, it's, it's like that network. A network that joins several different computers in order to help us communicate at a global scale. Great, thank you. The other key things about the internet is the redundancy. So if a link is down someplace, we have the ability to go in different ways. Uh, the other thing is, is it uses standards. And this is what you find, and this is why the internet has taken off and done so well, is the standards are all used and everybody agrees to the standards. This allows the internet to expand. So everybody can part participate, everybody can add routers, everybody can add it to continuously grow the internet. So we got a great video from Airtel. Can we play video one, please? What is the internet? What happens when you open a web browser and you type www.airtel.co.ug? Let us find out. Welcome to a world of boundless possibilities. The internet, short for interconnected network, is a global network of computers and electronic devices that are connected together. It allows for the sharing of information and communication between individuals and organizations around the world. 
Through the internet, we are able to apply the following activities. Communication, the cornerstone of the internet. Instant messaging, email and social media platforms connect people across the globe, bridging distances and fostering meaningful connections. The internet is the treasure trove of information. Such engines like Google provide instant access to knowledge, enabling us to explore vast amounts of information on any topic imaginable. E-commerce has revolutionized the way we shop. Online platforms like Amazon and eBay offer a vast array of products, providing convenience and accessibility at our fingertips. Entertainment has found a new home on the internet. Streaming services like Netflix, Hulu, and YouTube bring a world of movies, TV shows, music, and videos right into our living rooms. Online banking has simplified our financial lives. With a few clicks, we can manage accounts, transfer funds, pay bills, and monitor transactions all from the comfort of our homes. Education has transcended traditional boundaries. Online learning platforms and courses allow individuals to expand their knowledge, gain new skills, and pursue their educational aspirations. The internet has redefined the workplace. Remote work has become a reality, allowing professionals to collaborate across distances, access shared documents, and stay connected to their teams. Health and fitness have embraced the digital edge. Wearable devices and health apps track our steps, they monitor our heart rates, and provide personalized insights to help us stay active and healthy. Home automation has transformed our living spaces. Smart devices like thermostats, lighting systems, and voice assistants bring convenience and control into our homes, making our lives easier and more efficient. The internet, an interconnected web of possibilities from communication to information access, shopping and entertainment, finance to education, it has become an indispensable part of our lives. As we witness the visual tapestry of these applications, we hope you recognize the transformative power of the internet in shaping the way we live, work and interact in the digital age. Airtel, a reason to imagine. Okay, that, that gives us a good idea of what the internet is capable of doing. Now, some people, I get questions all the time, is, is it all the internet? So, is it all the World Wide Web or anything? So, Alan, help us understand the difference between World Wide Web, internet, email, and how they all work with the internet. All right, so I'll, again, stick to, you know, the analogy I used of highways, right? So. We've already seen, you know, the internet is like a series of, you know, highways connecting every, every single, you know, uh, you want to get from here to, to over there, right? Now, the World World Web is, think of it like a location or a building on the internet. So this is where you have your websites, you've got your applications, you've got your, you know, video content like Netflix and the like, right? So the World Wide Web is, is think, of, think of it like, let's assume this, this thing called the internet is a playground. The World Wide Web is like a section of the playground, okay? So this is where you actually have your content. You know, you, when you go in here and you type, I don't know, www airtel.com, right? It is part of the website. So the address is seated somewhere on the website, uh, seated somewhere on, or within the internet. And when I type it, what the internet does, it says, okay, Alan is trying to locate Airtel on the internet. So it basically gets my data, breaks it up, and then sends it to the address www.airtel.com. So basically, you know, think of the World Wide Web like a, a place or a building within the entire space called the Internet or the super, super highway network called the Internet. Now, email on the other end. How many of us use email? Or maybe let me put it this way. How many do not? Who still uses the postal mail? <laughs> yeah, well, so 
Email is actually electronic mail. So, just like, just like you see when you type in a website, like www.airtel.com, right? That data gets, uh, that, that particular piece gets broken down into multiple data packets. And the reason why it does this is because the internet would love to get you access to the information you're looking for at light speed. So if it does that by getting this one big chunk and sending it as a, as a block, it means it has to use one root, right? But what it does is it basically breaks it up and then sends it through multiple different routes. When it gets to the other end, it reconstructs it and then opens up. Now the email, basically, you know, you need to have an email application, right? So if, you, if you've got a uh, Gmail, Gmail, Outlook, or, you know, if you've got your company email like Ispat, you need to have a, you know, a, an email server, right? So, with an application that basically, you know, where you can type your email, right? So, first you type your message, then you've got an address, right? Everything comes back down to there's an address where that particular data needs to go and they, you know, and, and get access by that person. So, Within the application or on the website, you're able to compose your email, say, you know, dear Harish, this is, uh, you know, uh, what I'd like to talk to you about. And then put Harish's email address. So what happens is the email application breaks that email down into multiple data packets again, all right? And then sends it through the internet, okay? To the destination let's assume let's assume maybe the uh the service is on gmail so it will look and say okay where is the address of gmail so it routes it through the superhighway multiple routes gets the gmail server and then gmail says okay i've received this this series of uh you know data packets and they're meant say for ken right so it looks within and sees you know is Ken's address within Gmail? If it is, okay, then let me deliver it into Ken's mailbox. And as it's getting delivered into Ken's mailbox, it gets reconstructed into that message and it stays there until Ken opens it. Okay, so the intersection between, or the, the interaction between internet, World Wide Web, and email is, you know, Email and World Wide Web rely on the internet to work. They're within that global network village, right? So basically, you know, the, the internet is playing the role of the superhighway, playing the role using its routers, you know, uh, as traffic policemen saying, you know, you need to use that route, that route, that route. That's the fastest route for you to get over there. Right, so the World Wide Web is what powers our websites. It powers our content, Netflix, uh, you know, our search engines like Google, right? Uh, or, you know, that is also where uh, applications such as Airtel TV are also hosted. Email is also, you know, part of the internet. It's replaced our, you know, traditional post. Uh, post email so that you're able to send an email to a colleague, a friend, a business partner within uh, you, you click send and within a couple of seconds or depending on how many hops that the packet has to take within perhaps a minute maximum, that message gets to them. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, so I think the key thing is, is the internet is the core infrastructure and these applications sit on top of it. So things like World Wide Web, email, WhatsApp, all these different applications sit on top of it. So us understanding how the internet works helps us then understand all these applications work on top of it. Now let's change a little bit. What we want to do is talk about how do we get to that uh, internet? How do we get to the internet? So for example, um, I have a phone, I have a computer. How do I go to the internet? And there's kind of three ways that we'll be talking about on how to get there. There'll be fixed wireless, there's going to be fiber, 
and there's going to be a GSM or a phone service. So we'll talk about that. Um, let's go to the uh, video number two, please. How the internet is accessed and the role of the internet service provider. To access the internet, you need to have connectivity or a network connection through an intermediary known as an internet service provider, commonly known as an ISP for short. Let us dive into the world of ISPs. Today, we dive into the realm of the internet and explore the crucial role played by the internet service providers or ISPs. Internet service providers provide us with necessary infrastructure and services to connect to the internet by linking our devices to the global network. Airtel Uganda is an example of an internet service provider licensed by the Uganda Communications Commission, UCC, to provide internet services. An ISP can provide the end user with internet services using network infrastructure. This infrastructure is grouped into three sections which are categorized as Core network, which is the heart of the ISP. The backhaul or transmission network, which aggregates all traffic from all the end users or customers to the ISP's core network. The last mile, which connects the end user to the nearest point of presence of the ISP. The last mile technology can either be categorized as wireless or wired depending on the geographic location, type of application used, level of security, internet speed and bandwidth capacity needed, type of customer or the business strategy determined by the ISP. Last mile wireless technologies could be mobile best or fixed best. The most usual form of mobile wireless technologies is 3G, 4G LTE and 5G with G standing for the latest generation of standard. The higher the G, the better the speeds, applications and services offered. For customers to access 5G, 4G or 3G, they need a data capable device and a SIM card enabled with a mobile data bundle subscription. Finally, the user can be connected using microwave technology, which is a fixed wireless last mile technology with microwave an ISP can provide direct point-to-point -point links or point-to-multipoint connectivity for customers. Unlike 3G and 4G, microwave is ideally for SME and enterprise customers who prefer better quality of service and dedicated capacity that cannot be guaranteed using mobile options where the speeds and experience may fluctuate. Using microwave technology, a microwave radio is installed at a customer's premise and merits the need for a fixed installation at the customer's premise and location and requires line of sight. These technologies continue to evolve so as to provide higher speeds, lower latencies, better security and increased traffic demands that are growing exponentially. Airtel, a reason to imagine. Um, thank you. So that's that's talking about the fixed and the wireless networks. We're going to talk about fiber in just a second. Um, so a question back to Alan is, what kind of percentages of people are using you know mobile wireless versus fixed? Um, well, I, I don't know whether I have the exact percentages, but giving it a ballpark, you know, mobile mobile uh, connections account for more than ninety five percent, right? At least in Uganda here today. Uh, fixed is something that is uh, that is gaining traction, uh, but it's but it's still predominantly you know a mobile a mobile uh, uh, connectivity uh, uh, solution type of market. So so one of the challenges we have with you know uh, fixed is as I mentioned line of sight. There's interferences and things like that. So we're starting to see a lot more fiber in the last couple of years since I've been here. I've seen countless fibers running down the streets and countless poles coming up. And I'm sure you've all have seen that. Um, so what we want to do the benefit of fiber, and we'll talk about that in just a second, is the is the fact that it doesn't require line of sight. It has some higher speed capacities, and there's some more capabilities. You know, point to multi point with G ponds and services like that. So we have another video. Can we do the video three, please, on fiber? How the internet is accessed, the unique case of fiber. In the context of telecommunications, fiber optics is a technology that uses thin strands of glass or plastic called optical fibers to transmit data in the form of light signals over long distances. 
Fiber optics is widely used in telecommunications and ISP networks, including long haul and metropolitan networks, as well as local area networks in homes, offices, and data centers. It serves as a backbone for high speed internet connections, voice communications, video streaming, cloud computing, and other data intensive applications. Fiber optic technology provides numerous advantages over wireless technologies such as higher speeds, larger bandwidths, greater reliability and immunity to interference making it a critical component of modern telecommunications infrastructure. From a last mile point of view, fiber can be categorized into two broadband categories, namely fiber to the building FTTB and fiber to the home FTTH. Fiber to the home FTTH is also known as fiber to the premises FTTP. It is a broadband network architecture that brings fiber optic cables directly to individual residences or buildings enabling high-speed internet access and other services. Fiber to the building FTTB Fiber to the building is a broadband network architecture that brings fiber optic cables to a building or multi-dwelling unit MDU but stops at the building distribution point. Rather than extending fiber connections to individual living units, it is an intermediate solution between fiber to the home and traditional copper-based or coaxial cable connections. FTTB is commonly implemented in multi-tenant buildings such as apartment complexes, office buildings, or commercial centers where extending fiber connections directly to individual units may not be practical or cost-effective. While it may offer the same level of performance as FTTH, FTTB still provides significant improvements in speed and bandwidth compared to traditional copper-based connections, contributing to enhanced connectivity and better internet experiences for residents or businesses within the building. In recent years, there is a growing demand for internet services over fiber for both homes and business in buildings due to the increased demand for unlimited internet capacities without any data capping, security, and better quality of service with reduced maintenance. As much as it is easier and cheaper to deploy wireless services, the reduction in the price of internet and use of easy deployment of fiber infrastructure using existing networks like power and telecom masts has led to it being the service of choice as a complement to 5G, 4G, and microwave. Airtel, a reason to imagine. So we're seeing this massive rollout of fiber um, not just in Uganda, but it's a worldwide type of a thing. Um, what's Airtel's take on fiber and your rollouts and, you know, what, where do you see fiber going in Uganda? Yeah, before I get into, you know, where fiber and, and, and FTTB or FTTH is, is going, I think just tying up, because you we've now seen from the last two videos, right? Uh, we've got the fiber side and then we've got the wireless side and we've talked about, you know, 2G, 3G, 4G, and then 5G, right? So I think it's important for me to just sort of link all of this and then link it down to exa exactly, again, how the internet works. Because initially, you know, I told you about how all these packets, you know, uh, get, get assembled, you know, routed through the internet and then get to the final destination. But I think you must be asking yourself, how? How does this happen, right? How does this happen? Now... I'll give you some, some examples, you know, like for example, my mobile phone has my Airtel data package, right? So in order for this phone to connect me to the internet, right? It basically has a SIM card that has my number, which is my identity on the phone, right? But that's not enough. It needs to basically get I type www.airtel.com, right? Uh, so what happens? You know, okay, I've, I've typed it here. How does it get to, you know, that, that, that destination? So we've got a series of cell towers or sites. If you look outside the window, there's a big, you know, like tower, right? Now, we've got thousands of these towers across the country. I think we, we've, we've, now, we've now crossed over 2,500 sites, right, in Uganda, right, with equipment that basically has 
2G, 3G, 4G, and very soon we'll have 5G. Okay? So my phone then communicates to that tower and says, you know, Alan, who is using this particular phone number with this IP address, is trying to get to www.airtel.com. So it gets to the tower. There's some equipment on the tower that's got you know, a series of switches, routers, and a couple of other equipment. But that's not enough because you know, it's there, but then how does it you know, get from the site down again to where www.airtel.com is, is uh, stationed? So we've got fiber, okay, that is at that site. Lots of fiber, the fiber you're seeing, right? So you've got what we've seen in the video, the fiber to the home, fiber to the building, the part that is not in that, in that video is the transmission fiber, which is fiber to our data center. All right? So the data center is like the brains of, you know, of our network. Okay? So that fiber lives there, gets into one of our data centers. All right? Now, when it gets there, it gets into the brain. Now, there's series of equipment, you know, switches, routers, and basically there that at the data center, it determines and says, okay, Alan, who's over there on that mobile, uh, you know, mobile device is trying to access this particular website. So it first checks around and says, you know, do I have a caching server inside the data center where this particular website is already hosted? If the answer is yes, it says, okay, fine. It unpacks the packet, you know, then packages, you know, what the graphics that you're looking for, send them back to the site, then back to my device, which reconfigures uh, re, 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 uh, or reconstructs the data, and then, boom, www.airtel.com opens. If airtel.com is not on a caching server, within the Airtel data center, and perhaps it is seated at a server in London. Okay, now the, the brains, remember the data center is the brains, you know, it basically says, you know, I need to take this route, talk to that other network over there to get me to London. Now this is another series of fiber cables that leave Kampala, go all the way to the coast, into the ocean. And again, on the oceans, if you remember one of the videos that you saw, there was that map of Africa with various colors. Those are the various different internet submarine cables. Okay, so they snake at the bottom of, you know, of the various oceans connecting to various data centers across the world. So it gets over there, you've got these routers. Remember I said the routers, the traffic policeman says, okay, this particular address is somewhere in London. You need to take that route. You data packet, you need to take that route and everything goes all the way up to there. So everything is interlinked. You've got the sites, you've got fiber that enables your mobile uh, device. Now, let's assume you're not using a mobile device and you're using a Wi-Fi router, for example, like one of those over there. Now you'll find that Wi-Fi router is connected to, you know, uh, and maybe it's Airtel fiber to the building inside Isbat. Okay, so the fiber comes into Isbat, then it goes through a switch or a router with an Ethernet cable that connects back to this router that we're using here. So same process happens. Maybe perhaps I am accessing it over the laptop. www.airtel.com gets packaged up, goes through that router, high speed through the fiber, to the site, to the data center, and then onward. So we've seen the internet evolve over the years, right? For those who've done some research, you'll find you know, the internet started off as a you know, military project in the U.S., right? So... Uh, but now today, you know, we, 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 it's become part and parcel of our lives, right? So what we're seeing is 
because of the reliance on on the internet for nearly everything you know i've got my watch that basically you know spies on me on everything that i'm doing right so uh checks up on how i'm sleeping uh how healthy of a lifestyle i am i'm taking communicates with some servers in the u.s to basically say you know with a kind of lifestyle perhaps this is the type of exercise you need to do you know we're getting very reliant on the internet i believe in an is but a lot of you know i mean when i was when i was in in school please don't ask me how 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 how, how long ago it was but you know the library was a location I basically need to go to this place super quiet you know pick out a book sit down read take notes today the library is available on a laptop on a phone you know during covid you know you didn't even have to come to isbad to to study right lectures were being done over you know the phone on the internet on the on, on the laptop so what we've seen is as the world gets interconnected via the internet and we're now having smart devices smart smart homes we're not talking about smart driverless you know vehicles hopefully when we sort out our road network perhaps we'll have a tesla or two you know able to uh, come here but you, you've got selfless you know uh, drive uh, vehicles right so all of these require the internet now because of that the amount of data or speed of the internet required has grown really really high if you remember you know the guys who are a bit as old as me or a bit older than me you remember there's a time you know the internet was dial up right so you type in www.google.com click there was like a telephone symbol connecting dial up and it would take a couple of minutes before you know a request comes back then we had edge then we had you know 3g then 3g plus then 4g then 5g then we have then we had fixed unlimited internet right now because the need for the internet has increased and the speeds that are required have grown and grown it's no longer sustainable for certain applications to use mobile internet for example that is data capped because you'll find you're probably running an ai or program or you're running you know you've got a smart home and you go you know you you love airtel data you know you load 65 gb you also have kids at home uh, you know they want to do gaming on their ps5 you know with their friends uh, in in in, in uh, i don't know in india and you know you realize you loaded this 65 gb and boom in two days gone you need to load another 65 gb right now because you're a high data user then perhaps you say you, you come back to players like airtel and say you know do you have an option for unlimited internet where i can pay a monthly rental and you give me this amount of speed other is known as bandwidth for me to do whatever i want to do within that cap speed now to make that possible you need fiber because with a fiber optic i mean it's all about light internet is you know again it's light right there's no you know we've not yet gotten to the limits of how much light you know can go through that one single fiber optic strand right so that's why we're seeing you know fiber first came to the building for enterprises because the enterprises you know you've got lots of staff you've got students that are accessing the internet for learning the bandwidth requirement is a lot higher right so it started over there but with smart fridges you know smart tvs you know it's become a necessity in the home right uh so to answer your question you know where do i see the future of of fiber you know uh in uganda 
I think what we're seeing uh, with the fiber rollout, I think it's going to expand. At Airtel, we have a program right now where we're expanding our fiber to the home network. We've got an ambitious target of getting to 50,000 home passes within the next two years. Okay? So we've, we're doing all this because we, at, the, at the soul of Airtel, is inclusion and getting you know everybody you know uh, accessing data affordably and you know uh, at a quality rate that they that they want. So fiber, yes, is going to continue expanding. But as if you've read the news, you've seen you know UCC has also said you know Uganda is finally ready for 5G. So 5G is coming, but again at the backbone of 5G is fiber okay it's new technology that enables super fast internet access on say for example a mobile device like this MiFi that i'm currently testing right 5g okay or on a 5g enabled smart device right or perhaps you've got a router you know that's 5g enabled so you'll find where there is a need for very high speed internet and perhaps the fiber network isn't there directly. Perhaps maybe you're a couple of you know, kilometers away from the last fiber to the home or fiber to the building footprint. But with Airtel lighting up 5G across the site soon, then perhaps all you need is an Airtel 5G enabled mobile uh, router to basically, you know, bring in excess of one gigabit per second speed into your home. So I think the evolution of 5G will continue, but we see, sorry, evolution of, of fiber will continue, but what we'll see is, you know, 5G coming on to complement as the world gets hungrier and hungrier to use the internet. I think the big point there is the amount of data that people are going to be needing over the next 5, 10, 15 years is going to grow at a huge, huge, huge rate. And we're going to have to figure out ways to do that. Moving back to the submarine cables a little bit is you saw those maps. And these are cables, as, as you mentioned, cables that go under the sea, submarine cables. And they connect the continents, then they connect the places. Um, but there's a big cost for that. Somebody has to get a boat. Somebody has to get some big fiber. Somebody has to lay that fiber. I'm assuming Airtel's not doing that. I mean, Airtel's managing their Uganda, their towers. Who's paying for that submarine fi fiber? So you've got, you've got you know, international carriers, you know, uh, uh, that, that basically, you know, bring their, they, they, that connect the various continents together, right? But you know, even with Airtel, they don't they, they don't give this stuff to us for free. Access to you know those submarine cables free, right? So you find that you know we lease bandwidth from these carriers. You know we've got our own network that goes through you know Uganda because Airtel is you know is, is in 14 countries. We're also in Kenya, so we've got a fiber cable that takes us to the submarine cable, right? But we need to, you know, pay for the bandwidth to connect us to the rest of the world, right? And I think why this is important to, to understand is because I've often been asked, you know, you see when, uh, you know, when I'm in the U.S. or, you know, I'm in, I'm in the U.K., the, the cost of Internet is very, very affordable. Why is it very expensive in, in, uh, in Uganda? Well, one, we're a landlocked country, right? So... The closest the submarine cable is to us is Mombasa or Dar es Salaam. Okay? So there is first the cost of laying fiber, connecting all the 2,500 sites. That's money. Then there is the fiber connecting to the submarine cable in Mombasa and Dar es Salaam. That's more money. And then we need to pay for the bandwidth on the uh on, on the submarine cable as well so with all of this you know we basically you know
try and see how do we still manage to get affordable internet to Uganda, you know, even with all these factors. And, you know, I think Airtel has actually done a pretty good job of this because today on the mobile side, the mobile data side, right, you've got rates as low as 1.3 shillings per megabyte. And that is what Ispat University was, in, uh, was fortunate enough to, you know, uh, call, you know they, they, they facilitated us creating this, this uh, product for the students during COVID. And we were able to, to deploy, you know, that solution for them for a rate as low as 1.3 shillings per megabit. But, you know, that's why it's sort of, you know, important. To, it may not be as low as, you know, some places, you know, like India, for example. Uh, but, you know, you've got all that infrastructure investment that has to be done. Right? But we also pay a series of other, you know, service providers along the chain. Yeah. Um, recently in the United States and visiting one of my friends have 1.5 gigabits per second to their home. And I asked him, I says, what do you do with all that? And he goes, I don't know. I can't ever use the whole thing. But that's what they gave me. So he's happy to use it. So obviously over time, hopefully we'll see more use of data. Um, we have one more video, but I think one of the key things is uh, in, in the discussion of submarine is the closer you get the data to the customer, the lower the price it'll be. And let's go to the video number four, and then we'll come back and talk about caching. Thanks. The backhaul and core network. In telecommunications, backhaul refers to the network infrastructure that connects the core network or backbone to the access network, typically for the purpose of carrying data traffic from the access points to the central network. It is a critical component of the overall network architecture and plays a vital role in enabling the delivery of voice, data, and other services to the end users. Backhaul ensures network connectivity, data transport, network aggregation, scalability, and resilience as the traffic is transmitted from the end user right up to the ISP's core network. With exponential increase in the internet traffic, the preferred technology of choice to deliver backhaul and transmission between the last mile and the core network is fiber due to its stability to carry large capacities with minimal interference while maintaining an elevated level of traffic. An ISP, Internet Service Provider, an ISP core network refers to the central infrastructure that forms the backbone of the ISP's network. It consists of high-capacity routers, switches, and other network equipment that facilitate the routing and transmission of data traffic across the ISP's network and the broader internet. Here are some key aspects of an ISP core network. Routing and switching. The core network comprises powerful routers and switches that manage the routing of data packets between different networks and destinations. These devices make forwarding decisions based on IP, internet protocol addresses, and use routing protocols such as Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, to exchange routing information with other networks. Aggregation and peering. The core network serves as a point of aggregation for traffic from various access networks and customers. It consolidates the data traffic from multiple sources such as residential broadband connections, business connections, and mobile networks. Additionally, ISPs often establish peering connections with other networks such as content delivery networks and other ISPs to exchange traffic more efficiently. High bandwidth and capacity. The core network is designed to manage high volumes of data traffic as it carries aggregated traffic from numerous sources. It requires significant bandwidth and capacity to accommodate the demand for internet services and support the growing number of connected devices. Redundancy and Resilience ISP core networks are typically built with redundancy and resilience in mind. They incorporate redundant links, multiple routers and switches to ensure high availability and minimize the impact of failures or network outages. Redundancy measures may include redundant power supplies, network links, and diverse routing paths. 
quality of service management. The ISP core network may implement quality of service mechanisms to prioritize certain types of traffic or customers' traffic. This ensures that critical services such as voice or video streaming receive the necessary network resources, have lower latency and better performance. Security and Traffic Management ISP core networks incorporate security measures to protect against malicious activities and network threats. Firewalls, intrusion detection and prevention systems, and traffic management tools are often deployed to monitor and manage network traffic, ensuring a secure and reliable network operation. Authentication and billing. This caters to charging and billing customers for their internet traffic based on the subsidized plans that could either be postpaid or prepaid. When payments are done by customers, authentication is done to allow customers to continue using their service and allowed internet access when customers' subscriptions expire. All the ISP key activities that are conducted within the core network are managed through the Networks Operation Center, also known as the NOC, where all the traffic is monitored such that any routine or corrective maintenance is done to ensure the service is up and always running and that the network performance is kept to its maximum expected service delivery. We hope this content has been of immense help and will help you in understanding how the internet works. Airtel. A reason to imagine. Um, so one of uh, so what we've done now is we've actually gone through the whole aspects of the internet, how the internet works, uh, from getting your phone to talk to a tower to get to the data center, and then the data center, how it goes through the core network and even to the submarine cables. So one of the key things is how do we reduce our costs and speed up our internet connections? And as we talked just before that is caching. And what caching is, is moving the data closer and closer to the end user. The closer it is to the end user, the less cost it is for Airtel to then access that. So tell us a little bit about caching servers. What, what are you, are you guys caching stuff here? Who's caching servers? If my Netflix, I'm watching Netflix, where's it coming from here in Uganda? Yeah, so um, it's a good question. Good, good thing that you pointed to Netflix. So I, I don't know how you knew, but uh, um, we've actually got a Netflix, you know, caching server uh, here. So basically what it does is, what caching is, is you've got a server that stores content locally, right? So for the, for the example of, you know, uh, Netflix, right? So they'll have a movie or video library stored on that particular server, right? So periodically it will, you know, uh, have to synchronize with the main Netflix, you know, servers and say, you know, okay, this is the latest content uh, that needs to be seated on that box, right? So what happens is when you go to your smart TV or your, or your smart, smart uh, phone or device and you want to watch, you know, the latest series on, uh, on Netflix, uh, using your Airtel uh, uh, internet. What happens is, when you make a request for a particular show, right, your device will basically, again, you know, break it down, send it through your, your device, through the network, to the data center. And remember I said, you know, the data center is the brain. So it looks around and says, okay, do I have this particular content stored with me? In this particular case, the answer comes back saying, yes, there's a caching server over here, right? So what that does is then it says, you know, I don't need to go all the way to, I don't know, to Seattle or, or wherever the, uh, the content might be. I already have the content over here, right? So it will get, get it, reassemble it, and then send it back to your device. So what this does is, one, it lowers the cost for us, right? But I think more importantly, it improves the quality of your experience. Because then it means you don't need huge amounts of bandwidth to run that particular show. Because, you know, as it, let's assume the content is seated in, in, in the U.S., right? It is thousands of kilometers. Actually, when you snake it around, it's tens and thousands of kilometers, right? 
away from your device. So, because remember I told you, you know, the data gets broken up and then sent separately. Now, because it's going through such a long journey, going via, you know, multiple hops, sometimes some of that data, some of, that, some of those packets are lost. Okay? So then it has to come back and say, you know, I lost this particular piece of data. Can you send that to me? Now, every time it's doing this, even if it's in the milliest of seconds, you're using up more bandwidth. Because on the same session, you've got multiple packets being sent. But because this is on a local cache, right, the distance is short and perhaps you've got one or two hops or perhaps no hop at all, right, to your, to your device. So you're losing less data and it means, you know, you will use less bandwidth. But then also you've noticed, you know, sometimes for those who are like me and they love you, you know, watching their TV online, right, you go to Netflix, you click play, and the, you know, the, 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 the content opens up immediately. The show starts playing. It is in ultra HD, you know. There's no buffering. Then, perhaps, you know, you go try to watch a show on Amazon Prime. And then it first goes around a little bit, then opens up, and it's not yet HD. Then it takes a while for it to become HD. It's because... Netflix has the cache locally with Airtel and the content for Amazon is seated tens of thousands of kilometers away. Okay? So you'll find that it will take a very long time for that data, for the request to go and the response to come back, which sometimes is called latency. Alright? So you find if you've got the data, you know, the shorter the distance, the shorter the latency and the better, you know, the uh, connection experience if you're looking for, uh, if you're looking for speed, right? So that is how, you know, the caching works. But then you also have things like, you know, so, so as I wrap this up, you know, on, on, the, on the caching on Netflix, right? So if you're actually using, you know, your Airtel internet to access Netflix, I can bet you the experience will be a lot better than if you used another provider who doesn't have a caching server uh, within their data center. That is where you'll find, you know, on certain networks, perhaps, you know, same show, same Netflix. It sort of first does, does the walk around, run around, and then opens up. So you've also got, you know, the internet is an exchange, right? So series of computers that are exchanging against, uh, amongst each other across the globe. But you also have a Uganda internet exchange, right? Platform, right? The UIXP, right? So what it does is you've got series of content that doesn't need to go outside. Okay? So you'll find that those particular content, when you tap, you know, it very quickly returns the information, right? For businesses, for example, if you're doing your, your transactions, paying your taxes with URA, URA is on the UIXP, right? So you'll find that the latency is shortened to improve your service of, uh, uh, you know, the quality of service, but also so that, you know, the cost to digitizing a lot of these things reduces. I believe players like Jumia Uganda are also on the UIXP, right? So that, you know, those costs also, you know, reduce. Okay? So, yes, we've got some caching servers, you know, locally. You've got some caching servers not far away from Kampala, but they're perhaps in Mombasa, covering the East Africa region. This is where, you know, Google has one of, one of those. So that, you know, when you're doing your search, you know, on Google, it first checks and says, you know, do I have the latest uh, information on this seated in Mombasa? If I don't, then perhaps route it uh, all the way, you know, to the main uh, Google main server frame. So what we've been talking about is when I type in airtel.co.ug and you get a web page back, 
we've now kind of completed the loop of all the different things that are involved. It's not just a web page pops up. It has to go through an infrastructure. It has to go through routers and switches. It might have to go through a submarine cable. Uh, might go through a cache server, and then it returns back. And the whole goal of the ISP community is make that experience the best experience possible. And they do that by investing huge amounts of money in infrastructure, in towers, in caching, and things like that. So I hopefully everybody got the whole picture put together. I want to change just a little bit here. I want to look at where are we going with the internet? You know, so we've talked about where we're at today and some of the things. You've mentioned 5G a few times. Um, I just recently got a 5G phone, but I can't really do much. Now that I see you have a 5G SIM, we're going to talk after this. How, what is it, how am I going to benefit from having 5G on my phone? So, um, you know, I, I mentioned that, you know, the world is getting, you know, uh, more interconnected. A lot of uh, applications are based on the Internet. And, you know, these phones are basically, you know, pretty powerful computers, Right. So, basically, where you'll benefit when we finally, you know, get the spectrum allocation, you know, that it's been allocated now, get it, you know, uh, confirmed and the equipment uh, installed on the various sites so that it's up and running in the next couple of weeks or months. Uh, what that will do is, you know, if you're checking, you know, you, you run a speed test, today of your Airtel 4G, you'll probably, you know, depending on the location where you are or the time of day based on, you know, the utilization of the cell site where you're connected, you will probably get, you know, anywhere between 30 to 70, 80 Mbps, right? Which is quite good speed, right? But like myself, you probably a parent, right? So you may have people at home, or maybe perhaps yourself, you love gaming, right? Now, you've got one user, you know, playing their, you know, their latest, you know, game on, uh, I don't know, PlayStation or Xbox, and then you've got somebody else in the house that, you know, wants to watch uh, 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 their favorite series. And today, you know, we're fortunate that, you know, you've got options, if you can afford it, have a really huge TV at home so that you have a cinema experience. So you also want to have it in, you know, uh, 4K. You know, no, no, not Ultra HD is no longer good enough. I want, I want it in, in 4K with Dolby surround and all these things. And then perhaps there's somebody else who's doing research in the house. Another person wants to work. All of this is taking up bandwidth. Okay, and you'll find that perhaps where. 70 Mbps, 50 Mbps, 40 Mbps was good, all right? Because you're doing all of these, and then perhaps because you're technologically, uh, you know, in touch with the times, you've said, you know, my home also needs to become smart. I want a, you know, a refrigerator that tells me, you know, that X, uh, you know, you're running out of eggs, you're running out of meat, or, you know, you, or you perhaps want a house that, that's going to check the, temperature and maybe switch on the AC, draw the curtains, you know, and, and stuff like that. This is all running on the internet and you need bandwidth. 5G will make this possible because on 4G, when you have speeds as high as 70, 80, sometimes maybe 100, they're like, wow, this is, this is great. On 5G, if you've got 200, you're like, uh, well, I feel this is not good enough, right? And that's where you'll find, you know, you'll perhaps have one gig, 1.5 gig, like your, like your friend uh, in the U.S., right? That has 1.5 gig in the house, right? So perhaps today, the applications as a consumer for 5G may be limit, uh, limited, but I mean, we're seeing things like AI popping up. I, I really don't know how, you know, this AI thing really work still I'm still into that rabbit hole trying to you know figure it out right but you'll find that the need for data is just going to keep growing and growing and growing before you know a few years ago if you told somebody that you know you'll have cars that can drive themselves you know you'd sit in the back seat 
Nobody is, you know, driving the car and it drives you hundreds of kilometers without creating an accident or perhaps driving much better than you would, right? Uh, you'd probably say, no, I mean, that, that, that's tough from sci sci science fiction, you know, movies, but we are seeing it happening today. So, one, when we do switch on 5G, I mean, you're ahead of uh, a lot of us. You already have a 5G enabled smartphone, right? Or there will be options like, you know, a MiFi that is 5G enabled. There will be options for uh, a 5G, you know, uh, Wi-Fi router with an outdoor unit, right? Available for us to install that in your home or at your office, right? Um, so, you know, the times are changing, right? The need for data is, you know, becoming very, very, um, very, very, very much a necessity. We are seeing certain banks, even in Uganda, closing down physical branches and opting for, uh, opting for, you know, uh, opening up an account digitally using the app, okay? All of these, you know, you know, banks are now becoming digital, right? Airtel money, you know, is becoming, you know, vastly available and on the app, right? You've got many applications. You'll have things like, you know, perhaps players like Rocket Health think, thinking, you know, how do I take telemedicine to the next level? Today, it's all, you know, on the phone. But wouldn't you love to be able to consult with a doctor at home, visual? Okay? So, we're seeing that, you know, these possibilities are going to keep unlocking as we, uh, you know, as we get the world more digitally connected. And I think it is our job for players like Airtel, right, to facilitate this. Because... At Airtel, we're all about, you know, looking at that imagination that you have, right? And we give you, you know, the connectivity for you to say, you know, I now have a reason to imagine this is actually possible. So, yes, 5G is coming. FTTH, FTTB is here. 4G is already here. And, you know, the possibilities with what we can do with the internet is, you know, for me, it goes beyond my imagination. Thanks, Alan. Um, so for the ISBAT students that are here in the audience, I'm going to put a challenge out there, and maybe you can partner with Airtel. I would be even seriously helping fund a project like this. We want driverless taxis in Kampala. Yes? So the taxis, would there be no drivers in the taxis, and they would just be driverless. So that's... Isbat, that's your challenge for the next two, three years is to get driverless taxis out there. Um, Alan, I'm going to be, in about a week or so, I'm going to be doing some requests for my 5G SIM, so be, be on the lookout for that. Um, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for attending this. Uh, we do have some time for some questions and answers. Hopefully we gave you some good background on how the Internet works, all the pieces that you need, and you realize it's just more than just putting something on a phone. There's a lot of stuff that goes in behind the scenes. So, is there any questions out there from the audience? Or any questions from our live stream? I see a hand way in the back. Do we have a microphone for them? or I don't Good afternoon, everybody. I'm called Mayende Emi, and I'm an ISBAT student. Um, my question is, uh, in most cases, when trains... Sorry, could you speak a little bit louder? I can't, can't make up what you're saying. Okay. Uh, in most cases, when trains, uh, internet tends to be more slow than in normal days when it's sunny. 
I would like to know, does the weather also affect the fiber optic cable transmission or it doesn't? And if it does affect it, how are we going to get done with this? Because in most cases, you be like, you communicate with somebody, but uh, the internet, uh, the packets are a bit broken, broken, and then something of sort. Right, good question. So maybe let me answer that, then, you know, take up the next one. So it probably, you know, that experience you're having is where your internet is, ex is, is, is uh, delivered over wireless, uh, you know, uh, connection. And the wireless connection requires a physical line of sight, right? So part of the things that, you know, disrupt the, you know, the waves uh, as your data is being uh, transmitted wirelessly could be bad weather. If, if, you know, if you've got really, really bad weather that has heavy rains, it could affect the, the uh, quality of the internet that you have. Now, if you've got a, uh, a fiber cable directly into your premises, then the weather will not become an issue because then you're going straight through the network via fiber and you'll not be affected by the elements. Thank you very much. My name is Awoi Denis Stanley. I would like to ask a very simple question. We all know that the economy is going digital. There's digital currency. Yet we're all aware that there are certain links that are fraud link. And the internet expert do not recommend public Wi-Fi to do online financial transaction. So I would like to know how is Airtel Uganda working toward fixing this? So that we be sure the safety of our financial status. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alan. This goes to you. This question. Last time I had a discussion with you, it was in line of the other one was data bundle. But this time, I'm glad to meet you about the internet. Because I've been, ex we are using Airtel internet at my office premise, where I work from. And we have been experiencing always uh, uncertainties with the Wi-Fi, our Wi-Fi. You find that you can get like a 50 gigabyte or what. But within a short period of time, it gets that. So what's the problem? Is it the security part? Because I heard you when you were talking about the security, the management and security of the Wi-Fi. Where do you take us deeper into that? How can we manage our security, security of the Wi-Fi? Because we have been trying like to change also the password every month, but you find that still people still hack into the what? The Wi-Fi. So now, how can Airtel really help us with that problem that we have been experiencing as an organization? So that we safeguard what will we put money into. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dickens, Dickens Ochero from C4G, C4G cities. Uh, thanks so much. Uh Professor Andrew and Mr. Allen. I've seen that uh, how the HL is doing good, really wonderful uh, miracles in Uganda. I would like to know that how about the possibilities of having, like you talked about that, you know, we are having the fiber through the sea and all. How about the possibilities of having internet through the satellite uh, communication? How, what could be the possibility of that? Maybe not now, or maybe, I don't know, what's the plan for HL, or maybe in the near future? So sometimes we see the you know the the ISP has gone down, fiber has cut down, or the, is you know it's been affected a lot. So I think for a country when the there is no uh, service provider or the fibers, the you know it will not work like that. So how about the possibilities having through uh, the satellite section? Thank you very much.
thank you Mr. Alan. Me I'm Kurt Shepherd Nalinda. And my question is about the network, the comparison between LTE network and the 4G network. Which one is better, which one came faster than the other, which, which came recently compared to the other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alan and Ken. But let just 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 hold it. Let me answer this here so that I <laughs> then 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 yeah. So I will start with the last one. You know, uh, and one disclaimer: I'm not a technical person. All right. So Catherine, just be on hand in case I've not under I've not explained LTE. You know whether you know so. 4G, first of all, is LTE. Okay? 5G is also LTE. It's just a more advanced version of, you know, LTE. I think LTE starts above 3G. You've got 2G, you've got, I don't know, Kathy, is Edge part of 2G? Or? Yeah, so you've got 2G, which is sometimes called Edge. Then you've got uh, 3G which sometimes I think on some devices is represented by an H, an H or H plus, not quite sure what, what it is in full. Uh, and then LTE starts at 4G, goes to 5G. Some markets like, you know, like South Korea already at 5.5 G, okay? So the, definitely when you're on, on an LTE, you know, network, the way the data is, you know, aggregated you know on the cell towers is a lot more efficient efficient right that it allows a lot more you know sessions and bandwidth at a particular cell site level okay so the higher the lte or the newer the generation from 4 to 4.5 to 5 to 5.5 you will have a much faster network with a lot more bandwidth because the generation the technology generation at that particular point is a lot more advanced to allow more bandwidth and you know uh, speed uh, over that network Kathy how have I done um, yeah all right so now moving to your question Harish um, so satellite interesting that you know you're asking this question so Airtel, Airtel, you know, at a global level, is in partnership on a project called OneWeb, right? So if you, you know, just, you know, use Google, go in, you know, search up OneWeb, you know, it will come up. So what we're trying to do is cover the globe, right, with, uh, with uh, low orbit, you know, low orbit satellites, right, uh, to uh, basically, you know, be able to give really low latencies, right? Because, you know, most of the satellites are, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 kilometers, 50,000 kilometers into the orbit. Ours, and, they, and please don't quote me, but I think it's about 10,000 10, kilometers about. They are really low orbits to give better latency. So it was launched, I think, maybe almost two years ago. Uh, the last part of the orbit to be covered was will, will be Africa. So I think the last satellites were launched at the end of March, okay, which should cover this uh, Africa orbit by the end of the third quarter of this year. Okay, so yeah, so however, the the satellite option opportunity that we bring, you know, with OneWeb is more on uh, you know perhaps delivering connectivity into those hard to reach areas you know where so for example we've got today lots of game parks for example all right today that you cannot put up you know a cell tower because you know it affects you know the the, the wildlife you know you can't lay fiber because you know the Animals like the rhinos will dig them up and, you know, uh, destroy them. Um, but you've got options where you can actually have this one web satellite, 
you know, deployed. It's low orbit. It's got decent bandwidth. And we use it to backhaul back into the Airtel network so that it can extend the Airtel network to be available at that particular location. Okay? So, our one web option may not be the exact solution to redundancies because the reason why we're not doing it the consumer side, consumer way, is because in our network, we've already built in quite a robust redundancy. I'll tell you, for example, with Airtel Uganda, we have about four or five different links okay, that take us to the submarine cables. All right? And you might say, you know, perhaps they're all going through Kenya. No, we don't only have the Kenya route. We've got a route that goes down through Tanzania, down to Dar es Salaam, then down, uh, you know, across, across Africa, right? So what this does, and I mean, you've seen this, you know, there have been some times with certain ISPs, right, who rely on only one leg, say, for example, through Kenya, and there is a major cut on that particular leg, and you have the internet going off. Well, with Airtel, it won't go off. It probably will slow down, right, for a couple of minutes, right, as we switch traffic over to the lower route, okay? Then once we've switched it over, you'll start seeing, you know, the traffic build up and the quality of the network comes back up. So we've created that redundancy so that, you know, if there's an Airtel network, if it's fiber, right? If it's fiber, for example, to ISPAT, right? If we're only bringing one cable into ISPAT and it gets cut, there will be a problem, right? But let's assume, you know, your need is to ensure that, you know, you have redundancy all the time. We've got options where we can bring one fiber cable in and have a microwave backup in real time. So that, you know, if you've got a fiber cable cut outside you've got you know you've got the capability of falling over onto the uh, microwave backup or if the amount of data or the bandwidth plan that you have is quite high right then perhaps we have two different fiber cables from two different directions coming into your premises so the likelihood of both cables being cut at the same time with no sabotage is very, very, is very, very low, right? And we've today got plans such as this, you know, through, you know, Airtel, we're a, Cis, we're a Cisco certified partner. Okay, so today we provide things like, uh, you know, SD1, for example, right? And the SD1 solution that we provide comes with a protected internet link meaning you either have two fiber links or you've got fiber and microwave or microwave and LTE but you always have a redundant link and both links are switched on meaning that the equipment does some sort of load balancing and it keeps on checking which particular link is on or off or more stable and it gives the preference for that other link okay now which brings me to my next question from this gentleman I think it's called dickens yes so dickens is having a situation where you know i think people are, are logging on to his wi-fi at the office right and enjoying the bandwidth and then he's unable to use the internet for you know for the purpose that he you know he's, he's paying the bandwidth for now there are options, okay? Today we've got a managed Wi-Fi service, right? For those that cannot afford SD1. If you can afford SD1, SD1 is the best solution. And Airtel provides this on an OPEX model where you do not need to, you know, buy the equipment up front. Today, you know, you, you take up an internet plan and we say, you know, this is the bandwidth for a 
software-defined wide area network internet plan, right? That comes with a protected link. That comes with all. It comes with a you know uh, Cisco Meraki with a three-year license, right? On a lease-to-own model. So this could be fantastic for you, Dickens, right? Let's assume you know perhaps the budgets do not allow it. We've got a, another another product that we position mainly for the SMEs which is a managed Wi-Fi product, where you basically, you know, you've got equipment like what Ken has with, uh, with capability to do some sort of bandwidth shaping in the background or bandwidth filtering, or perhaps even restricting the type of MAC address that logs onto your Wi-Fi. Did you know, for example, you know, you can have that router over there Say, for example, I am authorized to access the, the, the Wi-Fi, but Ken isn't, right? But Ken somehow gets the Wi-Fi password. Now, if you have the managed Wi-Fi solution with filtering at a MAC address, what's required is, you know, to pick up the MAC address of Alan and all the other authorized devices and say, you know, these are whitelisted. So when somebody else gets the Wi-Fi and their MAC address is not on the whitelist, they'll latch onto the network and then get booted off almost immediately. So, you know, don't want to turn this into a selling opportunity, but, you know, after the, uh, after the, uh, the uh, session, I've got Catherine. She heads up, uh, Catherine, maybe you stand up. Uh, yeah. All right. Catherine heads up uh, our business solutions uh, site. She does, her department does all the solution designs. Just have a chat with her. I'm sure she'll be able to, you know, guide on what, uh, what, what you will need. Yeah, I want to just add on to that a little bit, and we hear this quite a bit. Um, you know, Simplify provides a lot of Wi-Fi equipment throughout all of East Africa. And one of the things that we seem to have, the, the naming, is Wi-Fi and Internet. A lot of times they think it's the one and the same thing. And a lot of times it's not. So typically your Internet will come into your building, fiber, fixed wireless, whatever different ways that you have. And then your network takes on the Wi-Fi. And this is where you have things like Wi-Fi 4, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6 products, things like that. And the, the uh, security, levels of security and things like that. So a lot of times they're two different things. So um, we get calls all the time, my internet is slow, and my first question is, can you isolate where the problem is? And so we say is, take your Wi-Fi, plug directly into your internet, run your speed test at that point, and if you're getting good speed tests, then it's probably not your internet, it's probably your Wi-Fi. But in the same, if it's the opposite, it's if I unplug my Wi-Fi, plug it into the internet and it's slow, and it's probably not your Wi-Fi, and it really, really helps on troubleshooting. But typically, your Wi-Fi is the piece that's in your building. It's usually a short distance. As I said, Wi-Fi 5, Wi-Fi 6, you'll hear AC, those kinds of terms. And then the Internet is the piece that comes in and connects that either through a router, a switch, or other types of devices. So I hear that name interchange quite a bit. I just wanted to make sure that was clear. Thanks. Thanks, Ken. So the final question that I took from a gentleman at the back, I just didn't get his name but I think if I got your question quite right you're trying to find out the role Airtel plays or intends to play in in providing public Wi-Fi right okay yeah so I mean public Wi-Fi is something that we've uh, you know also been discussing and trying to see how do we bring this to life okay so we've started off with a uh, with with one place as a pilot and that is the uh, international airport right and the reason why we selected this particular uh, location is because you've got a lot of you know tourists or business people or visitors coming into Uganda for the first time and haven't yet you know been able to get you know an Airtel sim card uh, to connect onto you know onto the network and tell you know loved ones you know I've arrived, say, for perhaps be able to, you know, call uh, call an Uber, right, uh, or Bolt or, or, or the like, right? And usually, you know, they have 
a smartphone that can latch onto a Wi-Fi, but without a SIM card, they'll not be able to use the mobile network, right? Until they've registered their SIM card and then got an, got an uh, authorization to get onto the uh, mobile telecommunication network for Uganda. So we decided to start over there. Today, if you go to the Entebbe International Airport, we've covered the entire place with Wi-Fi right from the parking area, okay? All the way until the boarding gates, okay? So it is the first step we've done, you know, as, uh, you know, trying out, you know, the different use cases, figuring out the type of equipment we need to use, right? We've also been supporting, you know, where you've got big events or seminars and the like, and you need to have, you know, Wi-Fi available, right? There's something Ken and I uh, did uh, for, uh, it was thing with ICT4D uh, conference a couple of years ago, right? Where Simplify and Airtel, you know, partnered again to provide public Wi-Fi. At that, at that particular uh, location. So these are some of the things that we're doing, all right? We are also enabling SMEs, all right? Uh, some of the SMEs, especially in the hospitality industry, right? The guys who are running restaurants or, or perhaps uh, small motels, guest houses, or even some of the, uh, you know, more established hotels, right? I'm saying, you know, we want to provide free Wi-Fi to our guests, you know, to enhance the experience, to enable them, you know, be able to transact online as they, you know, have a meal or stay in the hotel, right? So today, you know, Catherine has got all these solutions that they do for the SMEs. And the reason why we started with the SMEs is for us is some form of giving back because, you know, they'll probably be able to pay for their bandwidth and perhaps, you know, pay a little bit premium but may not be able to, you know, take out, you know, capex of thousands of dollars to, you know, cover the, uh, the, the entire premises. Where, you know, Airtel now can come as part of our reason to imagine, you know, enabling for them is say, you know, we can do this for you on this kind of contract. So to answer your question, yes, we do believe public Wi-Fi is something that is important. There's a couple of conversations already having with Ken around public Wi-Fi on transportation, on buses, on taxis. All of this is undergoing, you know, uh, some sort of a proof of concept. But very soon you will be able to find some, you know, buses that have Airtel Wi-Fi enabled. As well as ferries, you know, if you want to go to Kalangala today, for example. There are a couple of ferries that already have Airtel Wi-Fi on board. So public Wi-Fi is something, you know, it's not something of the future, it's something of now. So if you have a reason to imagine, you know, come, let's talk. Oh, thanks very much, um, CEO Simplify Networks and Alan. When I looked at uh, reason to imagine, I was like, whoa, what happened to the smartphone network? Anyway, that's not it. Uh, I'm kind of interested in knowing more about uh, the, other, the other side of the upcoming network. I mean, the 5G. Now, uh, my first question is, I want to understand about compatibility. You know, when you see a uh, majority of the population right now, we have from 4G backward. And I heard you say that uh, 5G uses uh, different frequencies and different technologies, that means it is very uh, incompatible with the kind of devices that we have right now, right? So is there anything, like maybe a microchip that we are trying to build that when it comes, we are going to put in the devices that we have right now, or when it comes, the devices now are useless. We have to, in case we need to tap into 5G. And then, uh, that's the first question I have. Another one uh, was a little concern when I was reading over the internet about 5G, things to do with L concern. But again, when I continue reading, I saw uh, regulatory agencies like World Health Organization, they are saying there is no effect when you are in a kind of a limit, like a distance. You know, with 5G, it will come with a higher uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. 
compared to these other networks that we have right now. So I want to know about the limit that the World Health Organization is talking about, that when you are not in that limit, you won't be affected with the upcoming technology 5G. And then my last question was, uh, it's kind of similar to this one of my brother. Though it didn't answer very much, so I need to ask again mine. It's uh, about cyber security risk. You know, there's a lot of uh, cyber threat online right now. Uh, finching, DDoS, DOS, and those other things. So, uh, of course, when 5G comes, there will be so many devices connected over the internet and there will be higher data being transferred over the internet. So is uh, 5G coming with an HTTPS or a security device to filter those other things so that people won't be affected? Thank you. My name is Oweta Jacob Emi, a proud student of ISBAT. Thank you. Yes, my name is Innocent from Isbat also. Uh, my question is, if I have an 4G enabled router and uh, with someone who has a 5G enabled router, so like if I want to access the 5G network, do I need to install the 5G router or I can still use my 4G router to access? Uh, secondly, it's about the fiber optics. Uh, I know there is overhead and the, the underground cabling in, in fiber optics. So I would, I would like to, for you, you to, to, uh, to explain more which one is best in data transfer rate between overhead or underground. And is Airtel using both or they're using only one? Uh, the last one is recently I have heard of uh, Airtel, Airtel installing eSIM. So uh, when I read that news, what what came in my mind was was it because of the 5G involvement or it was an earlier plan? So I would like you people to highlight more on the e the eSIM. Thank you. Thank you. I think let me first take this because this is one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Let me start with. Found, you know, convenience, you know, and also the ability to use some of these, you know, latest devices, right? Now, for those who, you know, love, you know, the Apple product and, you know, iPhone, you find that some, you know, may have, you know, either gotten somebody to send them a device from the US, you know, an iPhone 14, or perhaps they went to the US and said, oh, well, there's an iPhone 14 Pro Max. Uh, looks more affordable over here. Let me buy one. I'll go back, use it in, in Kampala. And then you get to Kampala and then you look for a SIM slot and there is none. Okay, so there have been cases like this, you know, where there's no SIM slot on the phone. Or you find you have a smartwatch similar to the one that I have and they say, you know, it has an eSIM. But, you know, if you love to do, you know, road work, you know, jog, but you don't want to go with your phone, you know, then you can have, you know, a SIM card on, configured on the device. And then with your earbuds, you know, you're able to, to continue moving around with your phone number as you work out, right? So it's something we've been working on. As I said, you know, we, as a business, we try as much as possible to enable your reason to imagine, okay? For applications or use cases such as this, you've got sometimes, you know, people who travel a lot for business or leisure perhaps, right? Out of the country, right? And you know that perhaps 
the roaming costs are usually very, very high. Okay? And the whole hassle of, you know, you go get a physical SIM card, you come back, you probably, you know, will either damage it or, you know, you'll lose it. You know, it's not very convenient. But if you've got a, a mobile device that is eSIM enabled, it allows you up to 10 eSIMs on the same device. So meaning I can have my Airtel line on an eSIM on this phone. I travel to, I don't know, to, to the UK. I have another line configured. I travel to the US. I have another line. So when I land, I just simply go into you know, my eSIM manager and select that line, and I am back up. Okay? So, not related to 5G, but related to Airtel's continued need to and desire to enable your reason to imagine. Now, you asked, I'll leave the fiber one uh, to you, and I'll, maybe I'll, I'll chip in. So, I'll move on to what you asked around, you know, if you have a 4G device, right, and you, perhaps it's 4G and 5G enabled, right? Do you need to swap out the SIM card? Is that what you asked, right? You need to swap out the SIM card, you know, get a 5G SIM card and a 4G SIM card. The answer is absolutely not, right? Your 4G enabled SIM card today, when we switch on 5G, will be 5G enabled, but you will need a 5G enabled device. So just like today, if you have a 4G enabled device, right, and perhaps you're driving and perhaps certain sections, the 4G drops, right, and you move into a 3G zone, you don't need to, you know, switch off the phone or, you know, change SIM card, right? You don't even need to reboot the phone. The phone is intelligent enough to say, okay, right now I've left 4G, I'm now in 3G, it will switch. You'll not even notice it. And if, you know, you run out of 4G, move in a 2, 2G zone, it will drop to 2G. And when it comes back to 4G, it goes back to 4G. Same thing will happen with 5G. Okay? Same thing will happen with 5G. You mentioned, uh, so I'll just come back to your colleague's uh, uh, question on, you know, perhaps you don't have a 5G enabled device, but you'd like to, you know, experience really good, good speeds, right? So we've seen this situation also with 4G, right? If you take a tally of the 4G smartphone penetration, for example, in Uganda, I don't think it's above 30%. David, am I right? 33% in Uganda. The only smartphone penetration is 33%, but of those, you've got smartphones that are 3G. 4G is probably around 20% penetration, right? So, does it mean that the guys with the 3G smartphones cannot enjoy Airtel's 4G everywhere? No. All you need is a MiFi. Today, you need a 4G enabled MiFi, and your 3G smart device transforms to a 4G enabled device through the MiFi or the Wi Fi router. Okay, so same thing will happen, right? We'll also, you know, when we launch 5G, we'll have some 5G MiFi options. We'll have some 5G indoor Wi-Fi routers. We'll have some 5G outdoor enabled Wi-Fi routers so that you can, you know, just turn on the Wi-Fi on your device and then tap into the 5G network. The question that, you know, about health, you know, I'll, I'll not comment about, you know, the World Health Organization and all those other things, right? Because I'm not an expert there. But the one thing that I can tell you is, you know, we're an ISO certified company, right? We're also a company that, you know, respects all the health standards, right? And we don't use any equipment on our network that 
doesn't have the certification to ensure that, you know, it doesn't cause harm to you. Now, there is a misconception that, you know, a cell site delivers, you know, harmful radiation and the like. I invite you to just use Google, do some research. The mobile device that you carry around in your pocket emits higher radiation than a cell tower. So if you're actually looking at, you know, which one is more dangerous, if any of them are, perhaps your cell phone is. Okay? But the one thing that I can guarantee you is, you know, this technology that we have today is safe. It is safe. And we would never put any technology on the market that is not cleared for, you know, the good of, you know, of, uh, of not just the human being, but also our environment. Because we've got that social responsibility. Yes, David? Thank you so much. Uh, this question keeps coming, and we're not going to avoid it. Uganda is 247,000 square kilometers of land. Germany is 357,000 square kilometers of, of land. Which of the two countries has a higher terrain density? The distribution of masts per square kilometer. It is what? German. One of the highly technical advanced countries. As I speak now, they are still building what? Masts. How many of you like sandwiches, sausages? Where do you warm them? In the microwave. How close do you interact with the microwave every day? So ladies and gentlemen, let's not worry about 5G. You have more things to worry about, like the, the microwave in your kitchen. You are more likely to die on a, a Ugandan road, whether through a car accident or border what? accident. Because most of you, I see you, you don't have your personal helmets. And you are worrying about 5G? Guys. Let's not worry about that. Let's use the same internet. Go and look at terrain density per country. I've given you what? German. That's from there. That means for, because when you build 5G, you require a shorter network, a shorter distance to put another what? Another mast. The same Germans produce Siemens. You know Siemens? You know their competence? This is in the x-rays where you go. How many of you have taken an x-ray shot in your life? Me, I have taken. And as you can see, I've only lost hair, but I'm still around. Thank you, David. So, and then finally, you know, this cybersecurity thing comes, a uh, question keeps coming up. Okay. I will say, you know, the first thing about cybersecurity, and just like any other security, is personal security, right? So, much as we put measures within our network to try and, you know, uh, ensure that you're safe, we also don't want to put measures that intrude on your privacy, okay? Because sometimes in order for me to be able to completely secure your network and your data, then perhaps I need to know what data, where is it going, you know? And then there we're getting into very dangerous, you know, data privacy space, okay? So there are lots of options today, right? Let's assume you can't afford a software-defined network, okay? Wide area network. But you're accessing the internet daily, right? And you know you're probably prone to being, you know, hacked, ransomware and the like. There are pretty good antivirus, you know, antivirus softwares available, right? 
You've got, say, if you're like me and you're using a PC that's running on Microsoft, today they, the Windows Defender that they have on there is quite strong. Okay? The only thing is, you know, you need to have an official version of Microsoft, right? So if you're, if you're like the usual Ugandan who's looking for a cracked version, it may not protect you, right? So today, let's assume you don't have, you know, you're not sure whether your version of Microsoft is the right one and whether your, you know, Windows Defender is working well. Good thing is Airtel is also a Microsoft certified partner. Come, let's talk. And I also get you the right, you know, Microsoft uh, package. And then if you update your Windows Defender, then, you know, malware and the viruses will be taken care of. Ken on Fiber? Um, there, was, there was a question on Fiber. I think the question was, is the difference between aerial and burial fiber? Um, basically, fiber inside the cable is all the same. So the fiber that's inside um, the jacket and things like that. So you have several different types. The, the, the main one that you see here is, is you see out on the, on the streets and on the poles called ADSS. It's a self-supporting uh, cable. And it's basically 24, 48, 96, 144 cores inside of that. It then has some protection around it so it can support different distances. So you'll see differences, distances of 50 meters, 100 meters, different things. They also have different cables that they have a metal member that can extend the distances that you need. Um, and then you have burial cable, which typically has an armoring around it. And I actually have some samples here we brought, and you're welcome to come and take a look afterwards. Um, all of the, the cable inside of it is exactly the same. It's just how they put the jacket and the protection around it that makes the difference. And so today you're typically seeing one gig to 10 gig cable. Um, you're seeing now 40 gig, 100 gig uh, fiber that's now capable. And I think as Alan mentioned before, we we're, we're still haven't hit the maximum uh, speed that fiber can do. And we're still working on some of that. In data centers, you're seeing some really high speed stuff that's going on. Uh, commercial switches now and even consumer switches are doing 40 gig fiber optic uh, for interconnections for some of that stuff. So the fiber in itself is basically the same. Now you do have a multi-mode versus single mode. And I get this question all the time is, well, multi-mode is multi, it should be faster. And it's actually not. Multi-mode was mostly designed as a better design for data centers. It's a shorter distance. The SFPs run cooler. Uh, they're usually more expensive as well as the cable. And they're usually designed for data centers uh, nowadays, with the cost and the, the increase in technology, single mode is basically caught up and there's really no difference. So you've seen pretty much everything that you see going in Uganda right now is single mode cable. I hope that answered your question. Um, with that being said now, we've kind of run out of time. Um, we do have some snacks and some drinks over in the back. So what I'd like to do is say thank you all so much. Um, Alan and myself and the ISBAT team are around. We can actually answer any of your questions. So we're happy to do that. So we're not necessarily leaving right now. So find one of us. We can answer any of your questions. Once again, I want to thank the ISBAT team. Thank you so much for this beautiful facility. It's been wonderful being here. I hope we can do it again soon. Yes. I thank Airtel and Alan and his team for coming out here. And thank you so much for participating in how the internet works. I hope it was enjoyable. If you have suggestions for future Tech Talk subjects, please let us know. We'd be happy to take a look at them. Thank you again so much. You guys enjoy the snacks, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Thanks.